I guess most of you have, have uh, uh, followed the Iranian nuclear dynamic in the media. Many people um, have only a superficial understanding of what's uh, happening there. The, the Iranian nuclear program is actually uh, more than a half century old. The first research nuclear facility was obtained from the United States in 1956. During the late 80s, Iran uh, successfully obtained uh, the beginning of a nuclear weapon program from AQ Khan in uh, Pakistan, namely the uh, P2 centrifuge. And the funding methodology was through what is uh, lovingly called the Bank of Crooks and Criminals International, but more technically called the Bank of Credit and Commerce. And in, in 1991, that um, narco-terrorist money laundering bank was put out of business. The AQ Khan centrifuges, which went to the uh, P2s, were immediately enhanced and turned into um, Iranian variants on the, on the level two stage, level three stage. They were replicated, they were put into cascades, and they began nuclear enrichment. Uh, nuclear enrichment beyond medical and civilian use. They are enhancing the enrichment of the uranium that they got, and the uranium that they got was mainly obtained uh, legally from Russia in three to four airlifts, and um, they're using daisy chains. That means they're not only using one centrifuge, they're linking them up so as it goes on and on down the assembly line, they get into a greater enriched version of this isotope, and then that must be converted into metal, the metal must be shaped, and it must go into a spheroid, or in the most advanced nuclear weapons, it must go into a rugby ball type of um, weapon. It's got to be small enough to fit on to a nuclear warhead. It's got to survive the G-force of a nuclear warhead. That's if you're not delivering it in a truck or in a backpack. And it's got to be triggered. We have generally used single-stage triggers, but the most advanced nuclear weapons have a two-stage implosion, and the double-stage implosion has now been discovered in Iran by the International Atomic Energy Agency. And this two-stage implosion works not at the microsecond version, which is used for conventional HE explosives, which is high explosive, high explosive explosives, but at the nanosecond version. If Iran is not trying to get a nuclear bomb, why does it have a two-stage implosion device under development? Why does Iran need 6,000 centrifuges, daisy-chained, a half a mile under the ground, to 24-7 enrich this stuff up to weapons grade? It's a matter of mathematics. How long will it be before Iran has sufficient material to produce what it needs for a bomb? How long will it be before it weaponizes that bomb? And perhaps the most crucial part is how long will it be before that bomb is deliverable? Lots and lots and lots of questions. First of all, who has funded this? Well, the Industrial Revolution bypassed the extended Middle East during the late 19th century and early 20th century. Um, in, in fact, uh, uh, in the Ottoman Empire, uh, uh, which uh, neighbors the region, um, there were no printing presses, just 99,000 scribes doing mainly ecclesiastical and government writings. So it has mainly been oil. The original 1908 oil pact with the British. Iran was under the thumb of Western imperialism, as was Iraq and the entire Middle East, for decades in fuel states that were fundamentally manipulated, created, and otherwise operated by oil companies through the League of Nations. If 
Iran had a, a way to find the money, it could only come from one way, and that would be oil revenue. I funded it. You funded it. You paid it on the mileage program. Every time you bought a gallon of gas, you funded the Iranian nuclear program and expansion. In Saudi Arabia, they made millionaires and stretch limos for sheiks. In Iran, they did something else with the money. And among the things they did with the money was they smuggled it and money laundered it through BCCI to AQ Khan. And AQ Khan sent a part of that money up to North Korea, and North Korea took its no-dong uh, missiles and exported them to Iran and retitled them Shahab missiles. And now we have a Shahab 3 that can go 2,500 miles and even can stretch to Europe. And this Shahab is capable of carrying a warhead. And Israel will be the first victim of any such attack. And as they like to say, Saturday first, Sunday second. And then others feel threatened as well. And this includes Germany, this includes the Gulf states, this includes Eastern Europe. If anybody thinks that there's a strategic interest in operation in Iran, the answer is no, there is not. There's a dogmatic one. Right away, it's completely unfair to stigmatize the Iranian people and the Iranian nation with the same broad brush as we applied to the mullahs. There are millions of people your age in the streets being brutally beaten, suffering gang rapes in prison, tortured just because they want a different way. Why are there so many young people constituting the new wave in Iran? Because an entire generation was lost in the 1980s during the Iraq-Iran war. Six digits of people. There's going to be an attack on Iran. How many innocent people are going to be killed? What's the collateral damage? There are at least, that I know of, at least 8 to 15 dispersed nuclear facilities in Iran. Some of them are underground as much as a half a mile. They're deeply embedded. They're redundant. Even the bunker buster that is now being rushed into development, the super, the super bunker buster by Boeing, can only be dropped because of its weight by a stealth bomber, or a B-52. Can Israel take out the Iranian nuclear facility without mass collateral destruction that will actually compromise and radicalize their best ally in the world's best ally for a free and democratic Iran, the general populace? It's a toughie. Next question. No one's going to just walk into Iran and bomb on Monday and get after-action reports, and that's the end of it. There's going to be a response. And what will that response be? That response is not a secret. That response is missiles fired at the heart of Israel, from the kibbutzim to the heart of Tel Aviv, from Lebanon from Gaza, from Hamas, from Hezbollah, both of which are Iranian surrogates using Iranian-made missiles. And there's something that Israel doesn't want. They don't want to lose one Israeli life. They will put it off to the very last minute. Because they know the minute they move against Iran, Iran will have its surrogates within miles of Israeli centers sending over 10, 15, 20, 25,000 missiles, as they've proven they already have done in other parts of Israel, such as Starot and North Lebanon. In addition, Strait of Hormuz can be blocked. It's 24 miles wide. It's only two miles wide, really, in each navigable lane going one direction and the other. Abkek. Saudi Arabian desulfurization plant in the western Saudi Arabian desert. Saudi oil cannot be uh, made suitable for uh, sea transport uh, unless it's desulfurized. 70% of that is going through Abkek. Raz Tanura 
Persian Gulf oil is mainly coming into a terminal at Raz Tanura. You take out Raz Tanura, a couple of 747s would do it. You take out Abkek, a couple of 747s would do it. You take out the uh, Strait of Hormuz and you block that instantaneously. 40% of the world's seaborne oil is stopped. 20% of the global supply. So what has Israel done to avoid this? Israel has assassinated numerous nuclear scientists uh, all over the world. They have uh, put Trojan horses in their computers when they're going out with their girlfriends in London uh, and leaving their computers in their room. They have embedded uh, microchips and other things in Iranian machinery and uh, somehow it just don't work. They've done lots of things to sabotage the Iranian program because it's better to sabotage it than bomb Iran. Now remember, we're not talking about Switzerland in nuclear. We're talking about a country that has continuously threatened to wipe Israel off the map and continuously delegitimized its very existence. Israel will be first in this problem, but Israel will not be last. It would be easy to think that Islam is all just one big monolithic creature. It's not. It has many, many divisions. There is Sunni versus Shia, and within Sunni and Shia, there are many divisions. And right now, they're talking about an arms race in the Middle East, possibly with Saudi Arabia and Egypt leading the pact. And we're talking about the proliferation of nuclear weapons, small ones, small ones, suitcase ones, similar to the ones that the Soviet Union is rumored to have made. We're talking about those falling into the hands of terrorists. Remember, a nuclear bomb does not need an ICBM to be delivered. It can be delivered in the back of a van if you can work it out right. So what is the answer? Why we can't take the MAD approach? MAD being mutually assured destruction, which created stability in Europe, uh, I'm going to use the word peaceful co coexistence if I can, uh, and uh, ultimately led to the downfall of the Soviet Union. You cannot have mad with madmen. If it was strategic, it would be different. But if it's apocalyptic, if it's, doc if it's doctrinaire, if there are a group of people in the government who wish to attack, not to further their strategic aims, but to further their doctrinaire aspirations, then that is a different set of precepts. And I don't think there's anybody in the non-proliferation world that I know of who, who thinks at this time that the mad approach will work with Iran. And by the way, who would, who would Iran be mad with? Saudi Arabia? Egypt? Israel? NATO? Who would it be with, with the, with the world? What about the proliferation to their surrogates in Lebanon and uh, Hamas? So I think that MAD is not going to work with Iran. The only thing that would work with Iran is not doing it. I know States. people in Texas who are looking forward to the end of the world. And when we go from real politic to uh, religious motives, in our nuclear weaponry, it's always a problem when God is on your side. How about sanctions? Won't work. Iran has been under sanctions regime for many, many years. They've been able to thrive. They've been able to assemble their nuclear program. They've been able to expand. The number one weapon against nuclear proliferation, starting in Iran and sweeping throughout the Middle East, is oil. Stop using it. If that can't work, if nothing will work, if it's too late to work, the sanctions are nice, but they're really just augmentative. There will have to be a military confrontation. That military confrontation will be apocalyptic. 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 Apocalyptic.